All right, it's about a minute past the hour, so I will go ahead and get us started so that we can make the best use of our time. Um, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar. My name is Jen Lamy, and I'm the Senior Manager of the Sustainable Seafood Initiative at the Good Food Institute. Um, so as many of you know, GFI is a global nonprofit organization um, really dedicated to advancing alternative proteins around the world. And our seafood initiative is really focused on accelerating uh, the development of cultivated, plant-based, and fermentation-derived seafood. Um, so before we get started today, I did want to go through a few housekeeping reminders. Um, the first is that this webinar will be recorded and you will receive the recording in the follow-up email. So don't worry about taking notes or, or memorizing everything that's being said. Um, you'll be able to watch it later and, and share that with colleagues as well. Second is that we do ask that you use the Q&A feature. Um, you can see the little Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen to ask questions um, instead of asking them in the chat, just so that we make sure we don't miss any questions. So please do that at any time during the um, webinar today. And I'll answer any quick questions um, as our presenters are speaking, but um, for the most part, we'll save those questions for the moderated Q&A towards the end of the hour. And then third, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat and interact with other attendees there. Um, please feel free to make this as interactive um, as you would like. And so on to today's presentation, um, we are very lucky to have a group of four um, graduate students uh, speaking today about GFI's Archetype Library for Alternative Seafood or Atlas tool. So all of our speakers um, will introduce themselves when I give them the floor, but um, they are all Masters of the Environment students at the University of Colorado Boulder um, and have been working with GFI over the course of the past several months, um, about a year, really making some key improvements to this resource, Atlas, um, which GFI originally rolled out um, at the end of last year. So we hope this presentation is helpful to you in understanding the tool and figuring out um, what it can do to help your purposes, but um, I also hope that it can kind of spark a longer term discussion about sort of how we use, you know, open access and, and available data to really understand um, the impact of alternative seafood and how to prioritize uh, decisions within that. So without further ado, I will turn it over to the student team who will be presenting today um, and go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Jen. Well, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, as Jen said, we are presenting our updates to the Atlas database. My name is Emily Heckman. I'm here with Leah Greiner, Nora Long, and Julia Park. We've had the pleasure with working with Jen um, from GFI and our capstone advisor from the University of Colorado Boulder, Pete Newt. Next slide, please. So today we will be covering information about our Capstone team and the responsibilities we had, general information about Atlas, our stakeholder engagement process, the updates that we made to the Atlas database, um, how to use the dashboard, um, the database and the storyboard, and um, other helpful resources um, that can help you better navigate Atlas. And then um, we'll conclude with a short Q&A as well. So the Masters of the Environment program at CU Boulder is a professional program, meaning that instead of a research thesis, we are partnered with companies and organizations to complete a professional project. Um, this project fulfills a graduation requirement for us. So our team was partnered with Jen at GFI to update the Atlas database. Um, we partnered back in February and have been working on this project for several months. And um, over the summer, we we were working full time on this project. Um, and so we were required to produce specific deliverables um, for our graduate program, and then as well as the deliverables that we agreed um, upon with GFI. So this webinar today serves as our professional engagement element um, for our program. And this is the final piece for us to um, complete our capstone project. So thank you so much for being here today. Next slide, please. Um, so with this project, Jen asked that we focus on um, improving the sustainability data in ATLAS and also increasing the usability of the tool. So ATLAS stands for the Archetype Library of Alternative Seafood. And this is accompanied by the Pisces database on um, GFI's website, if you're familiar with that tool. But ATLAS um, was built by Jen um, and other members of the GFI team. And our project was to help improve 
the sustainability metrics in the database to ensure that companies can have um, the largest positive impact on the environment when choosing which species to select for alternative development. So we want this tool to help replace unsustainable fisheries with alternative seafood products. Along with sustainability data, we um, were asked to improve the usability of data of Atlas. Um, and so because Atlas is made in Airtable and there's just an overwhelming amount of data, um, we were tasked with finding a way that could represent the data in a way that was easy to understand and visualize um, and you know, help users be able to navigate through this large amount of data. Next slide, please. So as you may know, there are plenty of companies um, developing alternative seafood. This slide shows a few, um, but there are plenty of others. As of 2020, or, yeah, 2021, there are 87 companies developing alternative seafood products. Um, and this industry continues to grow, and we hope that Atlas can help companies at the beginning stages of development maximize their limited resources and save companies of the time of searching all this data on their own. Next slide. So we believe that the work that these companies are doing is incredibly important. Um, the images on the slide shows the growing demand for seafood, as well as the anticipated production for conventional seafood. As you'll see, it's not possible to capture any more seafood from our oceans. Um, so we have an increasing demand and a finite supply. Um, and alternative seafood products can really help meet this consumer demand. Uh, these products are vital for meeting consumer wants and nutritional needs. And now I'll pass it off to Julia. Great, thank you. So as Emily said, um, Sorry, I just had the doorbell ring. There's some dogs barking in the background. Um, as Emily said, there is so much potential for development in this space. Um, so alternative seafood poses sort of a unique challenge compared to land-based protein in that there are over 100 species of seafood consumed globally compared to uh, just a few like cow, uh, beef, pork, chicken um, for your land-based proteins. So within this context, imagine that you are the CEO of an alternative seafood company or an investor interested in entering the sector. How should you decide where to focus your resources? Should you focus on replicating species with a high market share or on a fishery that has negative environmental impacts or a declining population? You can go to the next slide. Uh, so GFI created a tool called the Archetype Library for Alternative Seafood, or ATLAS, to aid in this decision making. Uh, so before we dive into the tool itself, it'll be helpful to go through some vocabulary. Um, so we'll be referring to both archetypes and species throughout this presentation, so it'll be important to understand the difference between those two things. Uh, so if you think back to your high school biology class, uh, you'll remember that a uh, species is a group of similar organisms able to interbreed. So we'll be going off of that definition and we'll be referring to species by their common names. Uh, so for example, uh, Atlantic bluefin or albacore are different species of tuna. An archetype groups these species together according to their function in a culinary context. So looking again at tuna, we see here that uh, the species are broken down into two separate archetypes. Uh, Bluefin, big eye, and yellowfin are all higher grade tuna that are generally prepared as a filet or in sushi, whereas albacore and skipjack are often canned. Uh, so while all of these species are different kinds of tuna, they do not fall under the same archetype. So next slide. Uh, now this is a snapshot of the original version of database uh, that we were updating. Um, so this is a database housed in a platform called Airtable. And don't worry about interpreting all of the information here. We'll walk through it in more detail later on. Um, for now, just notice that Atlas organizes seafood by these functional categories or archetypes. So this helps users find information most relevant to the culinary application of the seafood they're interested in, in replicating as a, an alternative protein. 
the database pools environmental and market data from a number of different sources uh, for various kinds of seafood so that users can compare and contrast seafood types according to metrics like greenhouse gas emissions or mercury concentrations, uh, US menu prevalence, just to name a few examples. So our job as a capstone team was to improve on the original version of this database. So we began this process by reaching out to stakeholders for feedback on the existing database. Uh, we asked users to test out Atlas and respond via survey or interview if they had any recommendations for how to improve it. There were three major takeaways that we gathered from 10 survey responses and three interviews with alternative protein companies, researchers, nonprofits, and investors in the space. So first, uh, stakeholders wanted a more accessible and intuitive user interface that would allow them to more easily compare and contrast different kinds of seafood. Second, they wanted more comprehensive sustainability metrics that expanded on the existing score to include measures like bycatch or ecosystem impacts. They also wanted more location-based data to better understand global seafood markets. Finally, some stakeholders wanted data at the species level, in addition to existing data at the archetype level. We found that this was more common around, among stakeholders that were focused on developing cultivated products who are replicating a specific species, such as Atlantic salmon, compared to stakeholders focused on plant-based products, which might attempt to replicate broader categories like tuna or whitefish. So now I'm going to take some time just to go through uh, what metrics are included in the Atlas database. And we'll go through each of these in a little bit more detail in a minute. But uh, first, I just wanted to explain that uh, the Atlas database includes both the raw data and a score affiliated with each of these metrics. So the scoring system that we used uh, normalized all of the raw data to a zero to one scale designed to indicate priority for alternative seafood development. So scores closer to zero indicate lower priority for alternative seafood development, whereas scores closer to one indicate higher priority. So just to give a few examples here, um, something like greenhouse gas emissions. Um, if there were a fishery uh, associated with high greenhouse gas emissions, uh, that would be a high priority fishery to replicate in the context of alternative seafood. And so it might have a score closer to one. Um, if uh, for something more relevant to market data, like US menu prevalence, uh, if something had low US menu prevalence, wasn't very popular among consumers, it would have lower priority for alternative seafood development and would have a score closer to zero. So with that in mind, uh, we'll start going through each of these metrics just to explain what they mean. Um, and on each of these slides, I've included the source for where we got the data, a brief description, which I'll go through, um, and how the scoring is relevant to that particular topic. Um, so this will just be a brief overview, but if you have any questions about any of this later, um, we'll have time for that in the Q&A. Uh, so environmental sustainability uh, refers to the overall sustainability score associated with a species or archetype uh, that is generally related to impacts on the stock in question, um, impacts on other species, ecosystem, um, and general management effectiveness. Uh, there are also factors that are uh, more relevant to aquaculture um, compared to wild caught uh, fisheries, um, and those are also incorporated here where relevant. Next, uh, we have greenhouse gas emissions. And so that is just the midpoint of estimates for greenhouse gas emissions averaged for a species or archetype across various production methods. So that includes both aquaculture and fishery data. Next, we have uh, mercury concentration. Um, and so mercury concentration is referring, referring to the mean mercury contamination level uh, in parts per million for um, a given species or archetype. Next uh, is edible coefficient. And so I'll take a little bit longer to go into this one just because it's a maybe a trickier concept to wrap your head around. But um, the edible coefficient is referring to the percent of an animal's weight commonly eaten by humans. So if you think of a fish, um, there are the parts of the fish that are commonly eaten um, and parts that are commonly discarded, like bones, head, et cetera. 
Um, and this can vary according to different cultural contexts, um, but we pulled data from the, UA, uh, the FAO UFISH database, which takes that into account and tried to get a good average across uh, different practices. So if something has a low um, edible coefficient, that means that less of the seafood or less of the animal is actually eaten. Um, and therefore, it is a higher priority for seafood, alternative seafood development, um, because uh, for animal welfare reasons, um, you would have to produce more of the seafood in question to produce the same amount of food, um, if that makes sense. So that's edible coefficient. Moving on to the next one here. These next four metrics are all uh, sort of market related data. So here we have US retail sales, which is just the dollar value of sales in US retail. Uh, next we have US menu prevalence, which is just the percentage of top US food service establishments with a given archetype on the menu in 2019, which is an indicator of consumer preferences. Next, we have US import and export value. So that is just the US dollar value of imports and exports uh, to the US in 2020. And similarly, US import and export volume refers to the volume in kilograms of imports and exports to the US in the same year. So all of these metrics um, have, we can go to the next slide. All of these metrics have an individual score associated with them on that zero to one. Uh, but they're also all averaged together into an overall score, uh, which is meant to uh, combine all of this information into a useful uh, way so that users can just quickly look at the, over, at the average score for a given archetype or species and um, come to conclusions based on all of these metrics combined. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to Leah, who's going to show you what we worked on. Yeah, so like Julia said, uh, we've created three, or we were working on the Atlas database, updating those metrics that she just went through, um, and we're spending a majority of our project on that. But in addition to that, we've also created an Atlas dashboard and a story to kind of help with the visualization component of this data. So first off, I'll bring us to the Atlas database, which is hosted on Airtable. So as you can see, this is the Atlas database. I uh, just wanted to point out really quickly, as you can see up here, uh, there, this is called the Pisces and Atlas database. This is because uh, Pisces and Atlas are actually companion databases. You can access both here in Airtable and on GFI's website. Pisces is just um, a database that contains species level scientific data. Um, this is kind of the information you can find here. But obviously for the purpose of our project, we were focusing on Atlas. So this Atlas tab that I'm currently in takes all of the data from these tabs you can see above. It includes the metrics that Julia covered, such as greenhouse gas emissions, mercury concentration, et cetera. And it aggregates all that information into this tab um, at, the, at the archetype level. So as you can see, we are in the main view right now. And this main view just provides a summary of all of the aggregated, aggregated data that I just mentioned. And as you can see, it lists all the archetypes right here. If you're interested in getting a different kind of view of the information, let's say for COD, you can just expand the record right here. It'll provide you summary information, both from Pisces and from Atlas, it contains all of the data that is contained here. So as you can see, provides some more information. If you're just interested in seeing the archetype level scores, go to this scores view down here. As you can see, it just contains the aggregated scores for all of these metrics that we were talking about in this view. However, let's say that you're interested in seeing uh, more of the granular data. For example, let's say for mercury concentration, you can go to one of these tabs up here. It will also provide you a link back to the source data if you're interested in digging in even a little bit more. But as you can see here, this contains a lot more data than just the scores. Um, as shown in the main or scores view. It also contains a lot more species level data. So if you're interested in learning more about that, you can even um, see what the scientific name is, um, a little bit more of the concentrations, number of samples, number of studies that we pulled, 
to get these numbers, all this information is in each one of these tabs. If you have any more questions, we can definitely go over those in the Q&A. But at this time, I'll just take us over to the Atlas dashboard and story, which are hosted on Tableau Public. And Emily will be dropping the links for all of these tools in the chat. So if you want to follow along, please feel free to do so. So as you can see, this is the um, Atlas dashboard, like I said, hosted on um, Tableau Public. We'll just give it a minute to load. Sorry about that. So as you can see, this is divided into three different panes, one for archetype level scores, species level scores, and market data. All this information with the exception of some of the market data can be found in the Atlas database that we just showed you. But this is just kind of a quick snapshot visual way to see the data. So first starting off in the archetype level pane, as you can see, here's the zero to one scale that Julia was talking about. But in this pane, instead of just giving a number score, it is um, rating the score by color. So in this context, the darker the color or the closer to one, the higher the priority for alternative seafood development. So as you can see, the archetypes are listed over here and all the metrics are listed above. Now, let's say you're interested in sorting the metrics, let's say by average score, just to see how the archetypes are performing based on certain metrics. You can go to this little box right here and sort them. So as you can see, based on the average score, billfish, which includes marlin and swordfish, um, has the highest priority for alternative seafood development in this context. If you're interested in learning a little bit more information, you can also hover over the box here. It'll provide additional data on things like greenhouse gas emissions by the um, marine mercury concentration, edible coefficient, et cetera. Like I said, all of this data is also included on the Atlas database, but this is just a quick summary to show all the data in a different way. If you only wanna look at certain archetypes, you can go to the drop-down box over here and just select the archetypes you are most interested in viewing. That way you don't have to keep on scrolling looking for the ones you're most interested in. Now going down to the species level pane, let's say you've identified an archetype you're interested in learning more about. For instance, let's do catfish. As you can see here, a list was automatically generated that shows the species common name. This list just shows all of the species that fall under uh, this archetype and that we have data on. Now, unlike for the archetype level scores, the species level scores only look at four different metrics. Uh, this includes environmental sustainability, greenhouse gas emissions, mercury concentration, and edible coefficient. However, the zero to one scale still stands here. So as you can see, these species are being compared on that scale. So you can kind of just see how the species are doing in comparison to each other based on different metrics. Just like with the archetypes, if you're interested in learning a little bit more, just hover over the bar and it'll give you a little bit more information. Again, the majority of this data can be found in the Atlas database, but this is just a visual way to see it. Finally, moving over to market data. Market data includes things like import data, export, consumption, and consumption per capita data. Just to clarify, the import and export data is very US oriented. Um, so we got it from uh, NOAA and it's all just US focused. Um, so when you are interested in learning more about the import and export data, what you can do right here is choose your parameter, let's say export. It'll generate a map automatically. And let's say we're interested in looking at catfish a little bit more as well. You can choose your archetype. And to navigate the map, you can just use this toolbar over here to zoom in and out. You can even search for certain countries if you already have one in mind. And just as with the other um, colors, the darker the color um, in this context, the greater the value. So for example, or the volume, excuse me. So for example, the darker the color, the higher the export volume, the darker the color, the higher the, ex the import volume. So as you can see right here, if you hover over Vietnam, just based on the color, you can tell that Vietnam has a higher export volume than Malaysia does. Now let's say you're interested in seeing some consumption data. You can change the parameter right here. And because the consumption data is more globally oriented, we actually got this information from the FAO. So it does not use archetypes, it uses predetermined FAO groupings, as you can see here. But it just generates the same thing, it creates a map as you can go in and based on the type of fish you're interested in learning more about, you can hover over the country, learn a little bit more information. 
And as we said, if you have more questions about some of this data or how to use the visualization, we are happy to answer those questions in the Q&A. We also will be providing more information on our Atlas user guide, which is linked here later in our presentation. Finally, we will go over to the Atlas storyboard. This is also hosted on Tableau Public. So what an Atlas story or a storyboard is in Tableau, it's just a narrative way to talk about the data and go a little bit more in depth than just on a dashboard, which can sometimes be a little small and a little hard to see some of the data on. So starting us off, as you can see, this first tab is called What is Atlas? We just included the web pages to GFI's website that details how Atlases can be used, the motivation behind it, and some of GFI's projects that go along with this tool. If you're interested in getting back to the underlying data, however, you can just click right here and it'll generate the Atlas database for you. Or if you just want a little more information about how to navigate the database and the following tools um, and some other information like that, you're more than welcome to click here to our quick start user guide, which is just a summary page of how to use the tools or our larger Atlas user guide, which also includes information on Pisces if you're interested in that. Moving on, this next page just shows um, the Atlas, oh, I'm sorry, the Atlas data uh, dashboard, which I just showed you. Um, same thing as in the previous screen. However, if you move on to these following tabs, labeled archetype, species, et cetera, this will be, give you a bigger view of those panes that I was going through. So for example, this is the archetype level scores page. As you can see, the graph is just a lot bigger, a little easier to read and navigate. It'll also include more information on what are archetypes, what are the scores mean, information like that. The species page is very similar to this. As you can see, it's a little easier to read, a little bigger. We'll also include some background information on the scoring. And then finally, for the market data, we grouped US imports and exports together on this map. So it'll provide information on, where, on what the data is showing exactly, uh, where it comes from. As you can see, just like in the previous dashboard, you can just hover over the countries and get some more information. Consumption data is pretty similar to this as well. So as we said, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to answer to ask them during the Q&A session. But at this time, I'll pass it off to Nora to talk more about the other resources that we've created for this project. Yeah, so um, to help users get the most out of Atlas, we have updated the user guide to include the changes we made and created a less dense quick start version that will help users jump right in. In the quick start version, we've um, included a section on both the Airtable version as well as the dashboard. It will walk you through the basics of how to access the tool as well as broadly how to use it. Uh, this is a great option for those who are more inclined to start exploring on their own. As mentioned before, within the database, we have included descriptions and explanations where appropriate, which will hopefully increase the ease of use um, for those who would rather not read the full guide. The longer user guide includes sections on both Pisces as well as Atlas, which will help explain the ways in which the tools are related and how they can be used together. In the Atlas section specifically, we go over the purpose of the tool, include a glossary of terms, describe how to navigate the database and use the ranking tool, give background on the data and scoring methodology, and finally provide an overview of the visualization. Next slide, please. We would love for users to share their thoughts so that Atlas can be continuously improved. Towards this aim, we've published a form where feedback and recommendations for future updates can be submitted. And I think Leah just added it in the chat. Next slide. And with that, we would like to thank you guys for joining us and open up the room to any questions you might have. All righty. So we have several questions um, that have come in through the Q&A. So I will just um, send them to all of you and whoever wants to answer, go ahead. Um, and of course, happy to provide my input where relevant. Um, the first one is, are there ways of quantifying the biodiversity impact of each species and archetype? Um, so maybe one of you can talk a little bit about what's in the Seafood Watch data. Sure, I can, I can take that one. 
Um, so Seafood Watch uh, has different scoring methodologies for different kinds of fisheries. So they have a set for um, uh, fisheries, specifically salmonid fisheries um, and aquaculture. And they have uh, different uh, factors and subfactors that go into the scores for um, each of those groupings. So um, some of the factors I mentioned earlier, like impacts on the stock, impacts on other species, um, impacts on the surrounding environment, and overall management effectiveness are the four major categories for, um, for fisheries. Uh, there are somewhat different metrics used to evaluate aquaculture, and some of those include um, uh, impacts of feed, um, uh, effluent, uh, of you know waste uh, management things like that um, that are more relevant to aquaculture. Uh, so the biodiversity impact um, is captured within those metrics. I think most relevant in the context of fisheries would be um, it might be sort of split between impacts on other species uh, and impacts on the surrounding environment. Whether you were looking at more ecosystem level impacts, it might be the latter versus. Um, things like bycatch would be captured under uh, impacts on other species. Um, so hopefully that helps answer your question. Great, thank you. Um, all right, the next question, um, which I can actually just answer um, very shortly, is curious if the Atlas project also coordinated or referenced data from the Blue Food Assessment that was published earlier this year. Um, unfortunately, we did not, just due to the timeframes, um, have the chance to incorporate some of the results of that recent research, um, but that is certainly top of the list for updates for 2022. Um, so thank you for submitting that question, Greg. Um, the next question, um, which there is also a short answer for, but would love for um, our panelists to speak to a little bit more, um, is this question about whether Atlas is a live dashboard. Um, so the short answer is no, it's um, not sort of live and pulling from updates to the data all the time, um, but would love to, to hear a little bit from our panelists about um, sort of recommendations based on the stakeholder engagement and the work that they've done um, that they've made to sort of keep the, the data as up to date as possible um, and sort of what the best timeframes are for the varying data sets out there. Um, and happy to add my thoughts after as well. Yeah, I can take some of this. So unfortunately, due to some of the data sets that we pulled from, we weren't able to create a live version of Atlas. Um, this is just because um, some of the data sources are not updating continuously, or we had to extract them from certain places. So just by that very nature, we couldn't create a live connection. Um, however, in our updates and in our exploration for some alternative data sources, we did try to keep it as relevant as possible. Um, I'm sure as you saw in Julia's part of the presentation, 2019 was a big year that came up. There was a lot of updates made to some of the databases and data sets that we used. So 2019 is a lot of the recent data. Um, other than that, we tried to keep the data relevant within the past five years. So that was our hope in trying to have the most up-to-date metrics. But obviously, as more data gets put out there, um, we're definitely hoping that Atlas will be continuously updated. Unfortunately, in some of our stakeholder feedback, we were um, asked to include things like market price. And I think I saw a future question on things like, uh, global markets, not just the US, um, consumer price information, consumer preference data, things like that. And unfortunately, some of those data sets are not either publicly available or just don't exist yet. So that's part of the reason why we couldn't include certain metrics or why you don't see certain metrics in here. However, like I said, as those data sets either become publicly available or just become into existence in the next few years, hopefully these data can be continuously updated on behalf of GFI. But I don't know, if, Julie, you wanna add anything to that? I think you you covered it. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, All righty. Next question is, um, congrats for all your hard work and thanks for sharing it with us. My question is regarding market data, which is now focused on the US. Um, is there any plan for expanding it to other markets, um, EU countries, Asia, et cetera? Um, I'll answer this one quickly, and the, the answer is definitely yes. Um, the U.S. data has been a little bit easier to come, to come by, um, and we certainly uh, want this to be a globally applicable tool and are looking at different ways to do that. Um, getting data on a truly global level is challenging, but 
um, going market by market might end up being sort of the, the method for getting this to be a little bit more uh, relevant to uh, markets around the world. So um, that is definitely um, on the list and, and EU and Asia are part of that um, as are several other regions. Um, and I think, you know, we have sustainability data on a pretty global level, um, but it's and, and a lot of the sort of human health and um, and animal welfare data are relevant on that global level, but really getting that market data um, is, is tricky. And some of the market data involved, um, as you saw, includes sort of prevalence on a menu, which is really helpful for users of the tool to be able to see, you know, how many of the sort of most popular food service establishments are serving this species archetype. Um, and so being able to get that data in several markets is really challenging, um, but we'd love to be able to um, do, you know, something, something like that for other markets. So um, definitely exploring options there and appreciate the question because we certainly want this tool to be as uh, globally applicable as possible. Um, all right, next question is, is there a similar wonderful online dashboard tool for plant-based proteins, fermentation drive proteins, fermentation fat and cultured meat? I think the question um, is really looking is, I guess it could be taken two ways, but my uh, interpretation was, you know, is there something like this for terrestrial meat? Um, and I know that uh, our student group has gotten this question in presentations in the past. So I'd love to turn it over to you all to kind of answer why this tool is specifically um, sort of relevant in the seafood space um, and maybe not as high um, priority, though probably still useful for terrestrial protein. I'd be happy to take this. Um, so I touched on this a little bit earlier in the presentation, uh, but one of the major differences between um, terrestrial protein uh, and seafood um, is that there are so many more, uh, not only just uh, species that are of seafood that are eaten compared to land-based protein, um, there are also so many more wild caught uh, forms of seafood that are consumed globally. Um, and so this means that um, there are so many other factors to take into consideration, uh, not just in the context of farmed species, whether it's land-based farming or aquaculture, but also um, uh, impacts on biodiversity, impacts on, on, on the environment coming from, uh, specifically from uh, wild capture of those fisheries. Um, so I think it's a combination of uh, there being so many different options out there. Uh, like I said earlier, over a hundred species consumed globally. Um, and also that unique nature of um, the fact that we are still capturing uh, a majority of the species of the seafood that's eaten uh, from uh, wild stocks, whereas most land-based uh, protein um, is farmed or domestically produced uh, or domesticated. Uh, I don't know if anyone else has anything to add to that, but I think that those are the reasons that it's helpful to have this tool to sort through all of that information, uh, specifically for seafood uh, in this context. I think you got it all. Um, thanks, Julia. Um, all right, the next question is, um, is there an intention in the long run to incorporate archetype specific physical characteristics such as fat content, melt point, typical habitat, um, textural characteristics, et cetera, that would be helpful um, for formulators in targeted development. Um, and I will just take this opportunity to plug the Pisces half of Pisces Atlas, which is our um, species characterization database. Um, so if you haven't checked that out, it's on the same web, web page um, within the GFI website as the Atlas tool, um, same Airtable base, just different tabs. Um, and we didn't do a tour of that today because it was outside the scope of this project. Um, but that really provides all of that species level data to help alternative seafood developers really figure out uh, what are those characteristics that give conventional seafood its um, uh, sensory and nutritional profile um, with the, the aim being that, you know, with the more of that data that we have, the, the more accurate the, you know, alternative seafood products will be. Um, so I will put a, a link in the chat again, just so that everyone knows where that is. Um, but certainly recommend um, checking out Pisces if you're sort of on the, the product development side or just if you want to kind of dig into some some real um, detailed data on sort of what makes seafood uh, what it is. So highly recommend that. Um, 
I did get a question directly in the chat. So let me grab that one um, before we wrap up. Um, this is a question for um, the student group. What are the benefits of focusing on sort of the archetype level relative to the species level um, and sort of what considerations came into play when you sort of decided to um, include some species level data along with the archetype level scores? I can jump in um, and if anyone else has anything to add, uh, please do. But um, so the archetype level kind of, as Julia explained, um, is really functional in a culinary context, um, you know, what the species is used for, how it's served um, and how it's perceived um, from consumers um, versus the species level data is very specific. Um, and like we said, when we were doing our um, stakeholder surveys and interviews, um, we found that a lot of companies doing self-cultivated products um, requested more species specific data. Um, whereas plant-based companies who were looking at um, larger products or a larger category to replicate, such as whitefish, um, were focused more on the archetype level. Um, so it was kind of a challenge to figure out how to group all of these different species um, at the archetype level and also then finding um, data that was available at the species level. Um, so it was kind of a give and take um, throughout the process to find ways to best organize this data, but that was um, ultimately uh, hearing back from stakeholders that species data was important to some of them um, and less important to others that we wanted to incorporate both. Great, thank you. Yeah, it's always, always a challenge to balance sort of uh, usability and understandability um, with some of the, the sort of <clears throat> detailed considerations of wanting to um, make all of this helpful. Um, love this, this question. Um, it's a big question for all of you. This is probably the first all ladies webinar I have attended in the last two years. Um, the question is, what inspires you um, to move the alternative protein uh, movement further? And um, would love to, to get some thoughts from all of our panelists as they're um, sort of embarking on their careers um, or back into their careers after spending some time in school. Yeah, I think everyone has um, a little bit different answer, um, but I'll start. Um, throughout our program, um, we're studying sustainable food systems and for me, really learning about the environmental harm um, done by conventional meat production and um, the limited supply of seafood that we have in our oceans and finding new ways to um, feed people nutritious food um, in a way that's sustainable for our planet. And that really uh, motivates me um, moving forward in this industry. I would say I'm um, motivated by, I mean, love for the environment um, and nature and the outdoors and um, also for good food and the idea that we can have both through alternative protein. Yeah, just echoing some of Emily and Nora's sentiments, just like seeing how this new innovation can really address a lot of our both environmental and market concerns regarding seed food consumption and just like, you know, over exceeding planetary boundaries. I think this is a really unique space to try to problem solve a lot of these issues. Um, I guess, first of all, I'll say that I was so excited to work with all of these ladies for the last year on this, but um, <laughs> um, for me personally, uh, I guess I had a background in um, researching marine microbiology in undergrad and um, and had found a way to connect that to food systems as I was getting more and more interested in sustainable food systems and found this grad program. And um, so this project was a really interesting way for me to tie all of those interests together. Um, but I, I think of the whole alternative protein movement as uh, something that's so exciting, especially seeing it gain so much traction in the last few years. Um, and I think it's uh, 
I'm, I'm just so excited to see where it goes. And this was a great time to be a part of a project like this. Awesome. Thank you all. Um, all right. Here is um, a little more of a, uh, a content specific question, which I think I can answer quickly, which is, um, does the 100 species include freshwater fish species like tilapia, Nile perch, et cetera? Um, yes, there are freshwater species included. Um, the tricky thing is we've said um, during the presentation is that not all of the um, data that we used is available on the species level. Some of it is just on the archetype level, especially some of that market data. Um, for example, the, the folks who are tracking retail sales of seafood um, are, are not really looking um, on a species level. They're just looking at sort of salmon, shrimp and categorizing that all together. Um, so we don't have all data on that detailed level level, um, but I do recommend going into the Airtable base um, within the web page to, to really understand um, what we have at the species level and, and especially within the sustainability um, tab and the greenhouse gas emissions tab and um, the, the human health tab on the, the mercury concentrations, you'll be able to find some species specific information and really dig into those um, freshwater species as well. Um, all right, question for the whole group is what other metrics might you want to include in Atlas if there were no data limitations? And I'll let anyone answer that one. I think some of the data that we weren't able to include, but a lot of stakeholders said that they would want, I briefly mentioned this earlier, but things like dock price, retail price, or other information like consumer preference data. I think we would all we would have liked to include that information, but like I said, sometimes the data just isn't publicly available or doesn't exist yet. So personally, I would like to see the data included. I think one thing I was really interested in seeing was um, mercury content by location, um, and I was playing around with that a little bit. But it, it's it's quite difficult to um, find out the location of where um, wild fish is caught, um, given the data that we, we have right now, so. Uh, another uh, factor that we had tried to include in this data set and um, put in our recommendations for future versions was taking um, some social sustainability metrics into account. So thinking about sustainability as a three-pronged issue where you have your environmental, your economic, and your social sustainability. Uh, so we, we had taken a, look at the um, some data on uh, slavery associated with different fisheries and aquaculture around the world. Uh, and we weren't able to get the right kind of data for um, getting it to line up with the different kinds of seafood and the locations that it was happening in. So um, there wasn't something that we included in this uh, version of Atlas, but we hope that that, could, that kind of data could be included in the future. Great. Yeah. And one other that um, I'll add on to that, that we're hoping to collect in the coming years is um, sort of data on consumer perceptions by archetype um, for alternative seafoods. So getting better understandings either through surveys or eventually through, you know, sales data um, as the industry really uh, grows just to understand, you know, is there a reason why consumers are more excited about, you know, a plant-based shrimp than a plant-based salmon or a cultivated swordfish instead of a cultivated crab um, and being able to sort of get that information incorporated um, and see sort of what the, what the reasons are behind that and be able to, you know, really add that data um, into the way that we're prioritizing um, development here, because of course we know the, the alternative seafood sector will only be uh, as successful as, um, as consumers make it in their interest. Um, okay, one more question that is in the chat function comes from Greg. Um, is there a potential to include future projections um, or projections of future populations of various archetypes or species in the future? Um, for example, if water temperature, acidification, or currents change significantly, how might that impact availability of a certain species and what role can seafood um, have to solve for that challenge? Um, I think this fits right in with the, the discussion we were all just having about um, sort of the, the cool things we can do in the future um, and would love to be able to um, include that because of course, you know, the, the current sort of, you know, ability to um, procure a species and from a wild fishery, for example, um, does not at all um, sort of 
assure us of being able to access it in the same way, um, say 10 years from now. And I do think that's an important consideration. It's one that's fairly challenging to model. Um, a lot of what we put in Atlas um, and in Pisces um, sort of comes from what's available um, to us. And so the more that that kind of research is done and the more that we can um, sort of take others, um, you know, of openly available data um, and incorporate it into this tool, the better. Um, so I just wanted to read that one out loud because I think it's super, super important and something where um, I certainly hope that we we get some, some really good research and data to incorporate in the tool um, in the future. All right, and then one last question, I think, unless any more come in in the next couple of minutes, um, but I would just love to hear from each of our panelists about um, sort of what surprised you the most or, or what was most interesting to you um, throughout the course of this project, um, either whether that was a challenge or something um, that you, you know, learned about the industry um, or something that um, has really sort of sparked your interest going forward, um, sort of with your relationship to this industry. So we'll keep it super open-ended, but would love for each of you to comment on that. Julia, go ahead. Okay. Um, I was just going to say, I thought it was really interesting um, during the stakeholder engagement portion of this project, uh, hearing uh, from, especially from alternative protein companies about what they consider to be the most important factors when deciding on what species or archetypes to focus on in development. Um, and uh, especially coming from the standpoint of knowing that we came into this project focused primarily on the environmental um, sustainability factors uh, associated with each species, but knowing that, uh, you know, in reality, there's there are so many other things to take into consideration, like market preferences or, you know, market conditions and consumer preferences and things like that. And so hearing um, stakeholders sort of balance some of those things in our conversations was really interesting to me. I agree that the um, stakeholder engagement piece of this project um, was most exciting to me. Um, and also just to see how many companies are um, starting these products, starting to develop these products, um, and just how much the industry has grown since we started this project. Um, I feel like every time we look at how many alternative seafood companies there are, the number increases. Um, so it's just it really exciting um, starting our careers to be going into a growing industry. Um, and I would also say that it was really interesting to see how much data is available on seafood and how even though there was some specific metrics that we were hoping to include, then there wasn't um, data on that. So, um, you know, just like finding what is available and what isn't and how we could incorporate that into um, this database. I think going off of that, it was exciting to see not just the companies that are operating in this space, but also the researchers and the investors who are really um, kind of keenly watching what happens here. And along with that, it is cool to see that um, in these different spaces, there's different research going on. So even though some of the data, like Emily said, wasn't available, it's cool to see that other organizations are asking the same questions that we were asking in our research process and development process, and that they're really taking steps to fill in these knowledge gaps. So. Personally, I'm really excited to see what happens going forward with this, and that's kind of where my interest lies as well. I would um, have to agree with all of that. Um, I really enjoyed messing around with the, the data and um, was super excited to see just how much information there is out there. Um, and yeah, looking forward to seeing um, um, the industry becomes more transparent in terms of um, data and information. Great, thank you all so much. Um, we are just coming up on time. Um, so thank you everyone for attending and for asking those thoughtful questions um, and participating in the chat. Um, I just dropped a link in the chat to um, our newsletter, Turning the Tide, um, which is a quarterly seafood specific um, newsletter on all things alternative seafood. Um, and our quarterly edition for December comes out next um, week. So feel free to sign up to, to get that um, next letter. Um, and yeah, if anyone has follow-up questions, either for me or our panelists, um, please feel free to reach out to me directly um, and I will get you in touch with the right person. 
But thank you all so much for attending. Um, keep an eye out in your email later for follow-up materials um, and wishing you all a great rest of your day. Thank you.